Welcome to the 99th annual meeting of NMPA. Yeah. A special thanks to Devin Dawson for that performance. I first met Devin when he showed up at one of our songwriter town halls, and he spoke very passionately about songwriter issues. And it turns out that he's not only a great advocate for songwriters, he's also a great singer-songwriter. We normally reserve that slot for an unsigned writer to come perform for the publishing industry. But Devin was just a little too damn good, and so he's just been signed by Warner Chapel. And so congratulations to Devin for that. Now, he doesn't yet have a label deal, but I understand that there's a bidding war going on. And so after tonight, that, may pr that price may have gone a little higher, and uh, we'll take some credit for that. We have uh, so many special guests with us today, but I especially want to recognize my colleagues at the other creator advocacy organizations. It means a lot to me that my friends and counterparts would be here tonight. And so I just want to recognize in the audience here Beth Matthews and Paul Williams from ASCAP. It's a little bit of a long list, so I'll go quickly. Mike O'Neill from BMI. John Josephson, the head of CSAC, Randy Grimmett the CEO of Global Music Rights, Neil Portnow from the Recording Academy, Linda Moran from the Songwriters Hall of Fame, Bart Herbison and Lee Miller from the Nashville Songwriters Association, Richard Burgess from A2IM, Carrie Sherman from the RAAA, Mike Huppy from Sound Exchange, and as a point of personal privilege, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame member Steve Miller is here with us today. I also saw Jim Donio with the Music Business Association, Barry Bergman with the Music Managers Forum, a very diverse group of people, very different interests in the music community. But there is one thing that all of us have in common, and that is that we are terrified of pissing off our keynote speaker today. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage my friend, Irving Azoff. <laughs> Test, test. The mic on? Yes. Thanks for having me, David. Thanks for being here. I have, some, I have a few notes. These are the things that uh, they told me I can't say. It looks I didn't, like a long list. I didn't, I didn't realize this was a, uh, a streamed, fully open to the press event, but I'll try and keep the filter as, uh, on off as much as I can. Wouldn't Has that ever stopped going? you before? I no, don't, no, no. I don't think so. Well, why don't we start by talking about what's going on at the Justice Department? I know that that's a topic that you're passionate about. For those that don't know, and I think probably everybody who's in the industry is aware, the Department of Justice is considering dictating to ASCAP and BMI that they have to issue 100% licenses, meaning that if they represent any fraction of a song, they would be required under their consent decree to license the entire song. Now, I know you've been very engaged on this issue. Maybe you could share your thoughts. Well, first of all, um, I'm, I'm celebrating, I figured out my 50th anniversary in the business. Of course, I started when I was two. But, um, and my son Jeffrey's uh, here with me today, a, a skilled young manager. But um, one thing that I, I, and it doesn't matter, every place I've worked in the business, whether it's been a label, a publisher, a promoter, a manager, if you do what's right for the creative person, the songwriter, the artist, it will eventually be right for your company and your career also, okay? So it really bothers me. Um, first of all, these consent decrees started in 1940, okay? So first of all, I don't understand, you know, why anybody with any sense in their head, and we have professionals at the DOJ, would even think we need consent decrees at this point. So, you know, um, and I wear two hats here. I'm here as a manager. Uh, I'm here as a principal in global music rights. As a manager, I think it's deplorable that it's being considered. Uh, it will, it would, the way it was explained to me what they're considering, um, they're just saying, well, we're just gonna enforce the decree as it was written. Well, some 80 years later, you're gonna come up with some new interpretation. And I, you know, and I think that Renata Hesse has, uh, you know, I, I think she cares about songwriters. But I think there are people on the staff, you know, these are people that are dealing with, you know, trillion dollar mergers. And I don't, they've either not spent the time 
or they just fail to understand or somebody has um, brainwashed them into how the business works. But the, the way, the impression that I got, if, if they were to go to 100% licensing, um, and it, it, would, it would create havoc for songwriters. I actually think it would be very good for the global music rights business, but in the long run, we have to do what's right you know, for creative people. And um, you know, to tell people that, you know, first of all, okay, if I'm with BMI and they have to 100% license, okay, I can only, what am I gonna do, only write with BMI writers? Secondly, how am I going to, are they gonna account directly to the writer that's not a BMI writer? Thirdly, are, are, the, you know, are, are songwriters gonna account to each other? Um, you know, we at GMR believe in bigger, higher rates, so if a BMI writer writes my guy a check, my guy's gonna expect a higher rate. It, it would be a, a total mess, okay? And, and, you know, what I heard from the Justice Department was a little bit of, well, you know, they don't really, you know, their job is to take care of the consumer, but I think they've, they, they've confused the consumer um, versus the licensee. Um, and, it, and it's scary, you know, and they, and they basically said it, that it started uh, because publishers wanted partial withdrawal and the licensees convinced them, oh my God, we're not going to be able to license music. Um, you know, and I questioned, I said, so are you trying to change copyright law? And they go, no, we're just trying to enforce the consent decree. So. Um, I've unfortunately spent time in Washington before, you know, on the merger of Live Nation and Ticketmaster. I've been in front of Senate hearings. I've been in front of House hearings. Um, I know the DOJ well from, uh, you know, we were in there for over a year and a half. I was back there on the uh, universal EMI merger. Um, and I just, it, it's, I don't understand it. I mean, I don't know how they could consider it. Now, I know that you had a, a call with Renata Hesse. Can you share a little bit about who was with you and how that call went? Um, you know, I don't really know if that was an on-the-record or off-the-record call, but, but I guess you heard about it. Um, <laughs> if there's any FBI guys here, I didn't disclose that. Uh, no, it, it, um, I was asked to put together a call. Um, I had another manager. Uh, I, I made it clear I was on the phone as a manager. Uh, I had another manager who, who, who cares uh, about the issue, uh, my friend Ken Levitan. Um, and we had... Um, a group of writers uh, that represented every one of the PROs. So, and um, it got very heated and very passionate, and I was glad that the writers um, let the DOJ people know how much it would screw up their lives if they did what they said you know, that, that it might do. Um, I think we ended the call um, with a promise to kind of stay in touch. But again, I don't think that Renata wants to hurt songwriters. Um, but something is greatly amiss. Um, you know, we all have to, nest, you know, th the bad news is we're a tiny little industry, but the good news is we're a big press industry. So, I mean, I think if they go to do anything radical before it um, could really, it'll get a proper hearing, and obviously there'll be Senate hearings and House hearings, so I don't think there's any reason for anybody to go out and panic that it's going to happen overnight, even if they should tomorrow say this is our intent. My concern has been both that the department lawyers who are working on this don't understand the industry, but also that they don't understand their role. Um, if Congress wanted to regulate our industry, there's a process for laws to get passed. But it seems like these career attorneys in the antitrust division are trying to regulate the behavior of the industry outside of the scope of what they were originally intending to do back in 1941. Well, I, I tried to be silent and let the, you know, just kind of moderate and let the writers have, have the, the, the predominant say. And when I jumped in and said, oh, so you're trying to change copyright law, they got very defensive um, and very vocal about that's not what they wanted to do. Um, but, you know, you know, this is the National Music Publishers Association. They were also clear to point out that, um, you know, when publishers asked for partial withdrawal, that that had started this process. Um, but but the, the thing that bothered me the most, not Renata, but there were other people on the, on the call that I thought um, were antagonistic to the entire industry. Um, you know, it was like, oh, these publishers that want to withdraw, and we just find ASCAP, and ASCAP and BMI don't, you know, don't, don't play ball, and now you've started a, you know, another one, and you've got CSAC, there's too many. But I said, wait a minute, I thought you like more players, you like competition, um, but it, it, it's clear that they've confused the consumer with the license, with the licensee. 
Well, the Register of Copyright wrote a letter to Congress that was made public. And in that letter, this is the government's foremost expert on copyright law. The Register argues that not only is this a terrible idea, but it actually violates copyright law. And we had a very hard time getting the department to even recognize this advice that they were getting from the people who know copyright law. And I was shocked by that. Yeah, I'm, I'm shocked by it too. Um, I, I've had several really prominent lawyers look at the agreements amongst a bunch of my management clients. And um, clearly, these agreements, and we've gotten legal opinion from really good lawyers, trump anything that the, you know, we think they, in a court of law, they would hold up and trump anything the Justice Department's trying to do. You know, but if you really think, I think behind it, there were certainly um, one, 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 you know, one guy on the phone that I think what he was in, you know, you know, he actually let something slip, but what I, the intent I got of what he said was, yeah, we can, you know, in 100% licensing, a licensor can go to ASCAP or BMI and, and you know, it's like a, it's like a and, and hopefully get lower rates. So it wasn't just that they were interested in the consent decree or 100% licensing. Um, it sounded to me like they were um, also interested in helping, you know, some companies that are, whose net worth, um, dwarf the entire net worth of every artist and every company in the music business combined. So. Well, that's exactly right. In, in 1941, the department was concerned about the fledgling broadcast industry, and they felt it needed protection from the monopolies that were ASCAP and BMI. You fast forward to today, and, and who are they protecting? Mature, giant technology companies that have much more market concentration in their own areas right. than we ever dreamed of having. Well, I think there's two instances. There's the 100% the licensing conversation that's going on, and then, then obviously, which will be your next question, what's going on with uh, Safe Harbor and the DMCA? Well, let's talk about the DMCA. I know that that's been a topic of interest to you as well. Um, you, op you recently wrote an open letter in uh, the magazine Recode. And for anyone who hasn't yet read this letter, I thought it was the most articulate expression of what our concerns are with the DMCA that I've ever seen. So I, I really urge everyone to go read that letter, but maybe you could summarize what your points were in that open letter. Well, j just some of them. It, it's simply what you said about, and what we're both saying about the consent decrees. Um, the DMCA is just simply out of date. It, it, you know, what it was meant to do in 1998, um, when President Clinton signed it, um, is they no longer need that protection. Um, you know, and I, um, you, know, you know, people like, you know, companies like YouTube and SoundCloud, SoundCloud should have to play by the same rules of their, as the competitors. Um, and, they, and they simply don't because of, uh, of DMCA. Um, you know, Apple, Spotify, they get licenses before they perform, you know, before they, before they, they put music up. You know, and for me, at a minimum, um, an artist should be able to issue a takedown notice and it should stay down. You know, this horrible whack-a-mole uh, situation, you know, that even the biggest of record companies shouldn't have to put up with. You know, I think David Benjamin uh, from Universal, who may not be here today, told me he had a staff now of over 30 people playing whack-a-mole. Um, who can afford to do that? And, and who wants to do it, you know, for that? Um, you know, I, I just believe that songwriters, artists should have fair compensation and control. And DMCA prohibits, you know, kind of both com combining, you know, and the only way they're gonna get that is if, if uh, companies um, voluntarily give up the right to safe harbor or there's a successful lawsuit against it or the laws are changed. You know, as an industry, the one thing that we have going for us is music has never been more powerful, never been more popular, and we as an industry have never done a shittier job at realizing it's one industry and cooperating. And the great thing about what this DMCA issue does, it has, I hope, the ability to rally the whole industry to say, we're all in this together, let's quit shooting each other and go after the root of the problem. You know, so for music to be more powerful than ever and less monetized than ever, you know, I mean, how many tens of thousands of people have to lose their jobs how many artists have to live without health insurance that somehow didn't, didn't happen over the years when they retire? You know, the thing that upsets me the most 
you know, as an old guy, is, you know, I had a, an ex-client walk in my office recently. When he retired 16 years ago, his income was about $450,000 a year from artist royalties, co-publishing royalties, uh, co-production royalties, and co-writing royalties. He's down to $40,000 a year. You know, he can't live. There's no pension. There, you know, there, there's none of this, you know? And people go, oh, the big bad labels. Well, guess what? The labels are with us this time. I mean, how many tens of thousands of people were down to three big labels? You know, and then I hear things, you know, oh, independent labels feel that they get, they get shittier deals than the major labels, so we should have compulsory licensing. Believe me, compulsory licensing is not your friend. It's the friend of the big tech company that's going to be able to freeze, know what they're going to have to pay, and freeze that. You know, I recently sat down with uh, a, a nice representative of Google, you know, and there's a lot of nice people in the business, and, and I like this person very much. Um, and he said to me, well, we don't make any money with our advertiser-supported model. We're, we're really paying more than we can pay or should have to pay. And, um, you know, I, I take issue with that. Um, there's two ways of making money. Maybe, you know, one, their advertiser-supported business means that we creator, we that represent creators have to see our creators underpaid. Maybe it's a bad business and they should get out of it. But of course, they're not going to do that because music is what drives the whole rest of their business in certain ways. Um, but the company's worth nearly a half a trillion dollars. So you're going to sit here and say, well, we don't make any money, but, our, the, but, but the market cap of our company is a half a trillion dollars, but we can't afford a couple hundred million dollars a year extra for your industry. It makes no sense. Um, but anyway, that is, is why I think Safe Harbor, but you know, but they can't win in the court of public opinion if this industry were all to, uh, all to get together um, and, and take a position that in their heart everybody knows is right. You know, I go back to when I ran uh, Universal in 1983 and I vowed I wasn't going to have the same mentality, but I know what happens when you run a record, when, when you run a big record company. It's, you're always, you know, as Alan Grubman says, you don't really have an employment contract, you, have a, you, you just have a severance agreement. So you, you don't really want really to take chances you should take, okay? It, you know, I, I, I understand, you know, why my friend Lucian is hooked on the, on the Google check, but everybody needs to pull together and everybody needs to, to affect change, you know? And artists and writers don't realize the power they have in the court of public opinion. Um, I have a, a, you know, a, a Silicon Valley friend who came to me and said, virtually everybody on the top list of you know, most socially followed people is a, is a musician, but you idiots don't monetize it. You know, and that's because we don't cooperate as an industry. We fight over who owns the rights and, and, and all that. But um, you know, we're all very lucky to work in the business. Music, um, I mean, we could have real jobs rather than, and I think it's a small thing to ask on the behalf of creators and also the people you work with who are losing their jobs. It's a small thing to ask to sacrifice some certain things maybe for your company um, to stand up to this. But, it, you know, especially at a time right now when you see what's going on in the country and, you know, and a, a, the fact that a Donald Trump can come from one place and a Bernie Sanders from the other, um, you know, you, you can rally people. You can rally people that have sat still and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that I feel a surge coming from artists. You know, there's going to be ads placed in some Washington newspapers in the next couple of weeks as these copyright hearings are going on. Um, and the number of artists and companies that are, that are joining and buying these ads and, and paying for these ads. You know, you got to make, you know, there's, there, there's one place where we can't lose. We can't lose in the court of public opinion. Um, and it's time we use that court, but we have to use it as a unified industry. Um, because we're up, up against formidable foes and government, you know, that believes that it's just, you know, they don't move. It's an interesting issue. Unlike when theft was our primary concern, a lot of artists were unwilling to go public about their complaints or their concerns. This one feels different. As an artist manager, how do you balance kind of the, what's good for the industry versus a particular client who, where speaking out may have repercussions? Um, I think we're past that. Um, I really do. You know, it, it, it's, if you got to pick a David or Goliath role, people that have been successful in the music business, the great artists, they've always been rebellious. Rock and roll has always been a rebellious form. 
I don't think it's a great risk or a great leap of faith for, for people to join a big group of their peers, you know, um, and I don't think that's going to be an issue. I just think we have apathy. You know, we, we are simply the worst people of any industry at helping ourselves. You've, you've served in a lot of roles in your career. I mean, you've been an agent, a manager, a concert promoter, a label owner, even a publisher. Out of all those jobs you've had in the industry, which one has been the most rewarding to you and which one the most frustrating? Um, I would say that um, being a manager has been the most rewarding. You know, um, you hear all this stuff, but I really like artists. I really like creative people. Um, I appreciate what they do. I think they're geniuses. Um, I don't quite understand why people believe that music needs to be, shall we say, compulsory or free or, you know, you have to make your art uh, available. You know, um, you know, if we were young, you know, my, my partner and friend Jim Dolan owns cable companies. They fight all the time with suppliers, right? You know, if Les Mundos doesn't like what Cablevision wants to pay as a license fee, guess what, he can take it down, you know. But music is, it's a double-edged sword, you know. It's, it's so special to people's hearts that they don't want to let us take it down. So why should the creator suffer that way? And, we're, and music is the only place where it really does. But, um, but no, I, I would say manager first, you know, is, is the best. And, I, and you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm really enjoying the global music rights um, launch and, and what we're doing because I think it's important and I think it's game changing. Um, and I think it's good for all the other PROs and it's good for publishers and it's good for writers. Um, again, I wish they would end the consent decrees and let everybody play on a level field. Um, but, and I, and I, don't, I don't think there actually is a worst. I've, in, I've enjoyed it all. Um, I will say the only thing that was, was really the pits was being an executive at a public company. Um, and and uh, I did my best. Um, I'm not exactly suited for that or skilled at it. Um, Severance package, though, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I paid. I paid to leave. I wanted out so bad. But um, no. But but that you know that 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 public company thing and music seem uh, you know a bit of a odd couple. Yeah. Well, maybe we could close with this in this room. I mean, I think we have most of the key decision makers from record labels, PROs, publishers tech companies, if we had to lock those doors and say that we didn't leave until we figured out how to coexist, what would be your advice to all of them? Um, look around you, look at the kind of the sorry state of where we are versus how important music is. Um, you know, Sony, the Sony Corporation um, was largely exploded and made popular um, off the back of music, they you know when, once they owned the when, once they bought CBS Records, the Walkman took off. Um, you know Apple, basically once they secured all the licenses for the for you know for iTunes, um, basically the iPod took off. You know I think you just got to look at the big picture and say the little things that I need to win as a label. You know I'm a label. I need a little better piece of the pie than the publishers get in the big picture is very silly. We're fighting over pennies and leaving millions and millions and millions of dollars on the table. Um, and look, we're a regulated industry. We're a regulated industry because people love music. I don't think we should, I don't think we can rely on the government to help us much. I think we got to do it ourselves. Um, and I think at the end of the day, um, when you go to a concert, you know, if it says appearing t tonight David and Irving, nobody's showing up. If it says appearing tonight Steve Miller, they're going to show up. So you better learn that, that, that the power comes from the artist. So for me, the way to get all this done is to, to wake the artist up. I don't care whether you're their publisher, their record company, their manager, their agent. Wake them up. Let them make some noise. And I, and I, 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 I certainly feel like there's a momentum that could help everybody and maybe win back you know, these tens of thousands of jobs that have gone away. Irving, I'm glad you're on our side. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.